I'm happy to see that quite a few people are interested in, in hearing out what we are thinking about 6G at our 6G flagship. So the way we organize this session is so that we first make very short presentations, about 10 minutes each. We don't take questions at that stage. After all these presentations, we all woke up and then let's try to be as interactive as we can be. So then we expect you to challenge us with your questions. So let's get started. Um, we are talking about 6G, but we really don't know what exactly we mean by 6G. And, and as we have heard today, uh, also from industry speeches, that, that this is really a research issue still, big time research question. And we are trying to figure out what it, what it could be, what it should be. And, and those who were invited tomorrow to this uh, a uh, white paper drafting workshop. We expect also your contribution so that we can jointly actually start to define what should it be. By the way, information about tomorrow's morning event, it's in Hotel K5, the same place where we went for uh, waiting for the banquet in that hotel lobby. So we start the uh, nine o'clock tomorrow morning. So I have six challenges that uh, are explained bit more, some of those as most of those aspects by our real experts, uh, uh, which really strongly influence at this early phase of this flagship our research. The first one is vertical striving development. We do believe that that when we look at the future technical solutions for different purposes. Uh, different verticals will have a say and will influence on how we optimize different solutions. Whatever that will mean depends on the particular needs of different verticals. Uh, also, it's, it's, we can take it to quite extreme if you, for example, look at what in Japan they have this society 5 to 0 concept. Unfortunately, this is quite small, but they have a plan to expand future ICT technologies to basically all fields of society in order to have savings in public expenditure, which I think it's extremely important to understand. And of course, creation of new, new businesses and thirdly, to, to support sust sustainable development of society. But in order to get there, we need disruptions in, of course, in technologies, in legislation and regulation, and also in value chains. This current operator-centric thinking is probably not the most efficient way to go. Second thing, I'm going through this very quickly. The experts will continue. Network architectures are changing. As we know, densification has been discussed quite a while already. When we are moving to higher and higher frequency ranges, uh, the range of uh, radios is becoming smaller and smaller. And in the end, we are really looking at super efficient short range radio, radio solutions. That's probably uh, uh, the best use case for, for example, terahertz communications. Also, um, we have different uh, network architectures different network deployments. Networks are going to be deployed wherever users are, in vehicles, in houses, part of the uh, urban infrastructure. And that will mean, of course, different things, again, from network optimization perspective. AI is extremely important. Um, edge computing will play a big role. And uh, again, we want to emphasize in our research a program that uh, these AI solutions are strongly driven through and by different verticals. And you really have to tailor solutions depending on the use case. New value chains will appear and must appear. Something that we had been working for quite a while 
we developed something which we called at that time micro operator concept. Uh, it was perceived maybe a little bit aggressive and then we started to call it vertical specific service providers. So there is a need coming from some vertical application and then we have to think about what's the best possible business model to serve that vertical. Maria will go through these things in, in much more detail. Then <clears throat> connecting the last billions of people, we have seen this, this uh, UN sustainability chart a few times today. This has been completely overlooked when developing wireless technologies in past. We do believe that we should take our responsibility and also there are very interesting research topics coming from these. Uh, Jaap, our collaborator from Lula University, is going to explain things that we have been thinking about and, and, and are working on currently in these lines. Um, autonomous wireless systems, that's the, one of the most ultimate cases that we can imagine for the, for the future, that there are lots of different things that we can automate. I'm not going to play this video because I'm pretty sure it would not work anyways. Many of you have seen this traffic example, at least Gerhard Fettweiss has shown it in many times in conferences where people are just crossing this junction and cars are going with high speed and nobody gets hurt. That's the, probably the most extreme case, but lots of different things in society can be and most likely will be auto automated and that will give us really nice boundaries and as, as, as technical requirements for our research because the requirements are going to be quite stringent. Then the last thing <clears throat> is that we need to have a major technology leap in order to make these uh, uh, targets reality. And in that we have this uh, six genesis national flagship which uh, is fairly big size activity uh, operated by University of Oulu in collaboration with Nokia, VTT, Aalto University, Business Oulu and Oulu University of Applied Sciences. When we started this activity last May, we chose four major fundamental research areas where we want to work and carry out research. This is in the beginning. We will re review, of course, on a regular basis our research agenda. Wireless connectivity is what we have been discussing about quite a bit these two days. And uh, there are lots of challenges, of course, there. Uh, there is ever increasing need of wireless capacity and data rates. Ultra reliable low latency communication protocols are still in their infancies. There's a lot of work to be done there. Devices and circuit technologies. One good example is communications towards terahertz frequency bands. There are lots of issues related to electronics and material sciences to work with. Distributed computing, how to make this kind of fog computing possible, how to distribute computation in different uh, application scenarios. Services and applications, what are the future new applications driving the development? We heard about holographic communications a little bit, teletransportation, things like those. What are the technical requirements coming from those what are the data rates we have to provide, capacity, latencies, reliability, and so on. And also in the services and applications area, what we do is, is that we carry out techno-economical uh, studies on, on alternative uh, business models, how we could actually operate these future networks and services. Before I, I give the floor to our experts, I just want to show one more slide. We have different tiers for partnership in, in our flagship. We have affiliate, pioneer and co-creator classes and this affiliate member, I think some of you have already joined at our boot. And basically that means that uh, uh, you agree to be a member and you are actively informed about whatever we do, whatever is happening. So it's basically email listing primarily. 
This medium tier is project collaboration, projects funded through various sources, maybe European Commission funded project is the most typical example. And the top tier co-creator is bilateral agreement, uh, which can be tailored to the needs of co-creator partner. Okay, now I would like to call in our first speaker. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. So uh, over these 10 minutes, I'll talk to you about some of our research in, uh, in wireless AI and where we think uh, most of the impact will be made. So the title is Wireless Network Intelligence at the Edge. So it's clear that 5G uh, and its long-term evolution is and will remain the main innovation platform for, for most of the needs in terms of connectivity and the advent of new applications. However, connectivity alone is no longer sufficient. Now, with the advent of or pro proliferation of a new breed of applications and high stake uh, of new breed of, of devices and, and applications uh, such as autonomous driving, uh, virtual reality, uh, and others, uh, increasingly data is, more, is generated at the edge. So, this massive amount of data cannot no, can no longer be transmitted to the cloud for training and inference due to latency, reliability constraints, but also privacy. So to solve this massive scale challenge while addressing these, these concerns, uh, intelligence can no longer be confined to the cloud, but this intelligence has to be pushed now towards devices, uh, over wireless, of course, and this is what we call wireless uh, network uh, intelligence. Right, so just uh, historically, so classically, uh, classical or centralized AI has been uh, confined to the, to the cloud. So you have your uh, dumb devices here, which for instance are transmitting their raw data to the cloud over wireless. And then the cloud does all sorts of training and inference, right, in a best effort manner. So obviously there are many issues. One of them is that data is in the cloud. So this is not good for privacy uh, aspects. Uh, uh, single point of failure. This is obviously bandwidth inefficient, especially in the uplink. Think of it as an autonomous vehicle transmitting all this data uh, to the cloud. And of course, as I mentioned before, this is not going to work for low latency and uh, high reliability applications. On the other hand of the spectrum, there is what we call federated AI. And now I think uh, the community is getting more and more uh, familiar with this. The idea now is to push this intelligence from the cloud to the device, right? So of course, as expected, right? And now the idea is instead of transmitting raw data from uh, the device to the cloud, what the device uh, do now is calculate some sort of uh, model based on the data that it has locally and uploads this model over the air to the, to the cloud and then the cloud uh, does some perhaps averaging or some, something smarter such as computing or, or other uh, computations. So there are many benefits here. One of them is data stays on the device. So we no longer have to send it to the cloud. So now it is the algorithm which is now coming over the air Think of it, for instance, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, aggregation. And this is bandwidth, in, bandwidth, bandwidth efficient. You, you continuously learn on the device locally. Uh, so the idea here, of course, is we are not getting rid of the cloud. The cloud stays, but we use it in a, in a, in a uh, smarter manner. And here, even the connectivity from the device to the cloud is no longer needed unlike the first case, right? Obviously, there are many challenges here. One of them is, of course, how do you deal with dynamics, especially in a wireless setting, uh, notion of stragglers, stragglers which are slower nodes, which uh, impact the, 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 the training, which now has to happen among all these devices. Uh, in, in addition to, of course, now, if you talk about a device, we have constraints in terms of memory, storage, compute, right, on the device. Uh, not only that, we also need to move beyond best effort machine learning, which is, uh, I mean, typically people throw in the black box, but we need to open it a little bit so as to at least try to guarantee uh, faster conversions in terms of training, uh, more reliable inference, right? These are uh, very important. And of course, uh, going even further, here we want to get, get rid of this uh, federating server or the cloud, where the idea now is we do pretty much the same thing, meaning uh, how, do you, how do you now collectively train a model among these devices uh, in a totally decentralized manner. And again, uh, many opportunities, but also challenges. Okay? So one slide here on machine learning. So of course we know that thanks to more compute power, more data, uh, AI has revolutionized many verticals, many domains. Uh, I'm not gonna spend more time on this. I think the media has done a great job for that. But the problem is this modern neural network architectures are actually compute hungry, Space hungry, of course, and, and power hungry, right? As I mentioned, there are cloud runs, so uh, this will not work for resource-constrained devices, 
and I think this is the use case for wireless. Uh, centralized offline training, no reliability, and we've seen some examples here. Uh, no privacy guarantees in the case of centralized, for instance, training, right? And the, the main paradigm was, of course, based on these dumb devices with an always-on uh, connectivity to the cloud. So this is not going to work for uh, these applications, okay? So now, uh, what our community has been focusing on, well, of course, AI is hype, so let's use machine learning to solve a variety of problems. Uh, currently, as you all know, the main focus is how do you apply black box machine learning for, so, uh, for the physical layer, and uh, there has been a lot of work in this space here, uh, mainly how do you uh, learn the model in a data-driven approach, uh, especially uh, in the presence, of, I mean, lack of models. But you can use it, of course, for, uh, I don't know, uh, optimizing the rate, uh, finding uh, optimal modulation coding schemes, and so on and so forth. Right. At the network, uh, an application layer, of course, there are many problems such as caching. So caching has already been looked at in 4G, but of course now we can talk about how do you orchestrate resources, uh, how do you now, if you talk about video streaming, how could you now uh, help predict the throughput and pre-buffer some content uh, locally, right? But the problem is actually these are mostly data-driven, centralized again, and best effort, right? But what, what about the other way around, right? So can we use now 5G connectivity to augment or improve machine learning? And I think this is, at least in our view, uh, worth uh, investigating. Okay. So what is this wireless edge intelligence? In fact, so this is, uh, of course, uh, still in its infancy. But the idea is that now, of course, as you, as you got it by now, we need to depart from decentralized cloud-based training, inference control, towards something more decentralized, where now devices have to do certain things. One of them, of course, how do you train uh, 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 this, this global model, right, among the devices? So what do we exchange? Uh, how often do we exchange these this, uh, model parameters? Uh, and here we have a certain constraint. So we have latency, reliability, accuracy constraints, privacy constraints. So I think this is a big uh, requirement, at least for, for 6G. Uh, memory, compute, power constraints. And of course here we, we aren't talking about big data. So big data is great perhaps for the GAFAs and BATX. But here the premise is we need to do, we, we are facing limited data. So every device has limited data samples and we need to, again, do training and appearance. Okay? Plus, of course, uh, wireless channel and network dynamics. Uh, already talked about the benefits, I'm not, I'm not going to, to dwell on this. Uh, so this is actually a nice summary of the vision. So what we did is on your right hand side, this is wireless as we understand it today. So latency, reliability, scalability. I think uh, this conference has done a great job. On the left side, we have machine learning. So machine learning, of course, is, is an evolving uh, discipline on its own. And the idea is also we could ca categorize now machine learning in terms of reliable, as I told you, reliable training, reliable uh, inference, uh, scalability in terms of devices, model size, low latency uh, in, terms of latency uh, in, ter in terms of training and inference. And the idea now is instead of doing what our community is doing, using machine learning for communication, which is interesting, obviously. But I think we could also look at the other way, other way around, meaning how do we use 5G connectivity to do better or distributed machine learning? And the idea here is we will be applying it for several verticals, right? And again, questions here, I mean, for research, this is a fertile for so, so many directions. One of them is how do you, so how do resource constrained devices train a uh, model in a decentralized way for different architectures with limited data? How can we do reliable, timely decision making and the risk and uncertainty? Because these are basically the, the, uh, the constraints. How do we do model, di uh, model dynamics and certainty and so on and so forth, right? And of course, now we also have uh, new requirements. So we, we have, of course, the 5G requirements, but here we need to ensure accuracy in terms of training, inference. Latency here, this is again for training. Energy is a big issue. Reliability, scalability, capacity. This is model capacity, not wireless capacity. Sample complexity. So all these are now uh, very important in the end-to-end -end design. Okay, so uh, we did apply some of these principles. One of them is federated learning. We applied it to the case of uh, so ultra reliable uh, V2V communication where the idea here is every vehicle has to transmit reliably its data to, to its uh, receiver, right? And uh, uh, the challenge here is the vehicle locally obviously does not observe the, the network wide uh, 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 latency in this case. So we want to learn it online, right? Uh, so we use, again, uh, principles of, of federated learning. So you can see there, every vehicle, based on this local data, calculates a model, uploads it to the server, roadside unit, roadside unit uh, averages, and uh, broadcasts this back. Okay. So again, many solutions for that. You could do it locally, remotely, using the roadside unit uh, with the latency and reliability trade-offs. 
Uh, yeah, so again, just a mention. And just a, a point here, so everybody is jumping on deep learning, but this is an instance here where we use not a data-driven approach, but a model-driven approach. The reason is because we already know uh, how this network-wide latency distribution is, and it's over there, so it's a, it's a, it's a generalized part of distribution. So the idea, we wanted to characterize the tail, right? So for those familiar with ultra-reliable low latency communication, we need to characterize this tail distribution and then try to ensure uh, uh, that we don't fall in the blue part of the tail, okay? Benefits, I think we already got it here. Lower latency, higher reliability, and it works even if the vehicle loses connectivity to uh, the cloud, okay? And uh, the results are very promising because we can get actually uh, same reliability as a centralized case with much less uh, uh, communication exchange. So this is uh, uh, one result, of course, among others. Okay. That said, so federated learning is a very nice approach. A lot of people, including Ericsson, Arm, and others are jumping on the idea. It turns out it's not very smart for a number of reasons. So one of them is, of course, the model can grow very large. So the payload grows very large. If you want to transmit this in the uplink, you, uh, you end up uh, in a number of problems. Uh, then, of course, uh, mobility. How do we deal with mobility? How do we deal with the fact that, of course, uh, uh, getting the global model is great, but you still need to adapt locally, right? So the idea here, this is a fundamental problem, obviously. How do you leverage the local dynamics? Uh, how do you leverage the global dynamics while still uh, 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 operating on your local data? And so on and so forth. Uh, something important here is, which is going to be even more important uh, down the road is how do we do the shared, lear lear shared learning on confidential data? So here, uh, for instance, blockchain could be useful, for instance, two enterprises, two companies, two vendors. Competing vendors need to, to collaborate uh, without sharing the private data, okay? Um, I'm just trying to speed up here. So there's another technique. Uh, one minute left, yeah. I'm good. So federated learning is great. As I told you on the right here, the idea is the device, the vehicle, the drone uploads the local model, but the problem is the overhead, right? Uh, and the, the, the size, of course, of the payload. There's another technique called federated distillation, which we, uh, we got inspired uh, by, by, by Jeff Hinton in Toronto. Here, the idea is we, we make use of what we call a teacher and a student. So the student is, for instance, uh, here on the, on, the, on the left side, the teacher will try to transfer the knowledge to the, to, the, to the student, in this case the device. So, as, as, so how, how, how does it do it? In fact, every device will calculate what we call a logit, uh, which is again uh, transmitted to the uh, federating server, for instance, and then we aggregate all these uh, logits, and then the teacher will transmit this as a regularizer to the uh, uh, weight uh, dynamics update. So here, as you can see, this is, so without the, the blue terms here, this is your typical stochastic gradient descent, but now we transfer this knowledge from the teacher to the student, and this helps actually obtain a much better performance while, while uh, 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 I mean, overcoming the problem of federated learning. So we did apply it in a kind of toy example, and the games were kind of uh, very big <laughs> games uh, in this case, so we want to continue this, this work. This has been published in NIPS uh, last year. So, uh, so yeah, this is it. And uh, I think this is almost the last slide. So we talked about data-driven communication, uh, but we also need to, for not, not to forget data-driven control. Because now the idea, of course, we talk about uh, controlling robots, drones, robotic arms. Control uh, seems to take uh, a lower role. But in fact, here, what we want to do, we want to look at the same story here. Can we do big control? So here you have a centralized commander uh, uh, or controller controlling a number of, of uh, devices. And on the right hand, now we can do it now more in a decentralized way while using the cloud, for instance, to, to help train the model. Uh, and of course, in the other case, uh, can we do it across robots? So this is also an ongoing work. Last slide here. So yeah, uh, this is basically this uh, in, in ten minutes the vision of distributed uh, edge intelligence. So the, the results are promising, but obviously a lot remains to be done. So for instance, in, uh, in terms of architecture, not the network architecture, but the neural architecture, how do we do a smarter data split, model split? Can we go beyond deep neural networks? Because obviously uh, DNN are actually not the, the, the best tools. Uh, algorithms, of course, so theory has not evolved much. Uh, we're just expo exploring more, more data and more power. Uh, hardware algorithm design uh, and so on and so forth. So this is just the beginning and thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Matti. And uh, uh, now we move from the software world to the hardware side. So, uh, looking at a bit of the things what are related to the RF and data processing towards terabit per second, uh, what trade offs there are, and what are the opportunities on the way towards the 6G as well. And uh, seen a lot of good. Uh, examples already during today and sharing a lot of the vision that has been provided uh, by the previous speakers as well. So we, we have been discussing about the densified network and edge computing and on the other hand as well the capacity for the high-speed connectivity and uh, many times I'm hearing a word without capacity bottlenecks. So what is infinity? Such doesn't exist in the hardware world but let's see how far and what are the means how we can get there. The other interesting part is that uh, radio waves are not at this frequency range anymore, just maybe for communications, but the radar imaging and sensing benefits from the terahertz in increased bandwidth and propagation properties of the different media. And these two items are actually giving the consequences that we really would like to see the bandwidths of tens of gigahertz for rate and both precision in sensing. And then that leads that we are interested about the RF frequencies in the range of 0 0.1 to 1 terahertz. So official definition is of, of course starting from the 300 gigahertz as we're discussing about the terahertz, but I, I think the industrial consensus and what we see in the 5G kind of conquiring the spectrum below 100 gigahertz, I think that's quite a valid uh, definition. Uh, in addition, we are seeing once again the scaling of different things and so forth. For example, antennas are getting extremely small. And that gives an opportunity for new form factors and the kind of surfaces of radios that I think we started to envision already 10 years ago when kind of nobody believed that you will ever end up of doing a, something real with the terahertz in this domain. Uh, that was kind of a chest for the scientific thinking uh, at that time. But uh, yeah, never say, ne never say no and, and, and say that something is, is for sure. Uh, so one of the key items is definitely that we need to have affordable hardware technologies. So we cannot stuck with the classical terahertz domain and use very specific gear and devices that are expensive and so forth. And what Professor Pfeiffer was explaining exactly, that we need to see how we can stretch CMOS and buy CMOS technologies uh, towards the terahertz and, and see the com how commercially we can make them viable because that's really the heart of the success in the communications industry. You can go the cheapest possible technologies, make them in a huge volumes, and, and that's giving the opportunity for having such a cheap chipsets and opportunity for the market to grow, opportunity for consumers to use it. But there are a few bottlenecks that are really serious. And for that reason, we are really meeting the physical boundaries and transistor speed will come, become an issue towards terahertz. So cheaper the technology, slower the transistor, and that mean, makes a trade-off that is hard to overcome. Generating power, power and avoid material and interconnect losses is an extreme challenge because now we are once again trying to do something which is one decade or two decades actually high, more difficult to do. And, and uh, finding the means to do that in a mass production level is definitely not simple. Industry is now learning how to use millimeter waves and we know that there is a lot of challenges still related to that. So the research is not over there even. But then as we go higher and higher, that's, that's uh, something that, that requires quite some time. So I think 2030 is, is kind of a good timeline to think about uh, commercialization of, of such things that we are having now in the research lab phase. Precision in manufacturing when the dimensions are really getting small is an important one. And as antenna elements are scaling down 
and the, typically the radiation is dependent on the antenna aperture, so basically the area that antenna is having. We need to have large arrays supported by potentially by lenses, as was explained earlier, and that is kind of a must even for short-range communications. Uh, what we see today, there is in the uh, left side a figure of the uh, operating frequency of some recent systems and examples where we see that the, there are a few systems that have been demonstrated in the range of 180 to even two, 300 gigahertz range. And the data rates what have been achieved are in the range of uh, at maximum 90 to 100 gigabits per second. Uh, some of these achievements are done in the three centimeter or one centimeter range. And uh, I would say that the, what Professor Pfeiffer introduced us today, so one meter, 100 gigabit per second, that's kind of the state, real the state of the art where the industry is standing at the moment. The other important observation is that we start to lose linear amplifiers. So we are looking at the same operation frequency as, uh, against the F max, and F max is the highest frequency where any transistor can have power gain, so, or, or it loses its gain. Basically, the power gain in the F max is zero, so you won't get any more amplification beyond that. And typically in the designs, as this curve is also showing that with linear amplifiers, the maximum operation frequency or carrier frequency, what you can achieve, is in the range of half of the F max. So if you're having a technology that can reach F max of 400, uh, 500 uh, gigahertz, your operation frequency with the amplifiers needs to be in the range of 200 to 250 gigahertz. And if you need to go beyond that in certain technology, you need to really go to the nonlinear mode. So using either mixer or a, a multiplier as an output stage. And that is known to be power efficient because you're relying on the harmonic power that the device is generating and not the fundamental. So you're typically losing quite a lot of power in that domain then. Uh, then feasibility of the terabits per second. And uh, as a simple RF engineer, I'm typically looking at that, what I can do with a single link, kind of with a simple modulation. Simple modulation due to the fact that also the power consumption of the digital processing will become a huge bottleneck. So if you really want to go the wide bandwidth, you definitely don't want to do an FFT there. And uh, uh, we have been speaking about the waveforms. And if you want to do a one terabit per second, just with a single radio link and having 16 to 64 QAM modulation, without any network capacity improvements from the spatial and massive MIMO gains, your bandwidth needs to be in the range of almost 200 to 250 gigahertz. So we are speaking about the bandwidths that are actually in the same range of the operation frequency. And uh, here in the left side, I, I've drawn the curves that, that the topmost one is one terabit per second, the second one in the, in the Red is 500 gigabit per second, and the 100 gigabit per second that we are achieving today is, uh, is then uh, plotted in the blue on the bottom. And we can see that uh, actually, yeah, that matches quite well, Six, 32 QAM, 64 QAM. We are in the range of, of 100, uh, uh, 100 gigabit per second with a bandwidth of 25 gigahertz, 30 gigahertz. And classically, if you go to the RF, uh, there are a few issues with the bandwidth. So if you want to expand the bandwidth, the relative bandwidth, really, with respect to the carrier, that's known to be difficult. And for that reason, it's typically 10 percentage of the bandwidth that you want to do. So single resonator zone, so which, which meaning that I'm having one LC resonator, is the key there. And in that case, uh, we won't reach the one gigabit per second. We are in the 100 megabit per second. So what 
we are kind of trading off that we should have quite a lot of multi-user gains depending on the modulation. Uh, six to more than 30x multi-user gains needed for one terabits per second for the network capacity at 300 gigahertz. So we are really extremely high operation frequency at that time as well. And that depends on the waveform. So if you want to go the hardware friendly waveforms which are simple and so forth, more you need from the network, more you need for the spatial gain and gains and so forth to have the network level capacity. So this is the biggest challenge we are having at the moment. So what is our focus? We need to really look at the key enabling technologies for the 6G, from materials to have low losses, not to waste the power to the unnecessary parts, to transceivers and sensing at terahertz range. Uh, approach, we need to understand the hardware first. What are the capabilities really taking the last possible performance out of the transistors that we are having at the moment? And then come back and start to look at how we construct the systems. So this is extremely important loop back when we are thinking about the future systems. So we need to make silicon-based transceiver designs due to the cost reasons from blocks to systems. Integration, scalability and performance of antenna arrays, including challenge of wideband modulation, is not a trivial at all. So it starts from the 5G experience. So there are a lot of things that we have learned already, but we are going to one or two decades more complex domain. So be patient and be ready to sacrifice quite a lot of research effort to this domain as well. Nothing is easy there. So we really need to focus on new technologies and materials beyond the IC core. Hope that we are getting a bit faster transistors. But what is typical in the RF engineering is that it's solved by clever, competent engineering as well. So no more slow applies. We need good engineers to make this and to help this industry from the transistor level up to the system level and find the best compromises towards 6G. So thank you very much. The next speaker is Tarek Talab. Tarek is our shared resort, resource with Aalto University, so he serves also as part-time professor in our flagship. Okay, uh, thank you Mati for the introduction. It's really a pleasure to give you some insights about um, this beyond 5G networking. My, my focus is really on networking, it's not on the radio access network. I know that uh, there are lots of experts on that field. Um, as uh, Mati has introduced me, actually I work part-time for, uh, for Olu University and also I work as full-time for Alto University as professor there. Um, so this is the outline of my presentation. Um, I'll give you some brief, um, very, very brief overview on the current standards of 5G. I think we have seen a lot of that in the presentations. Uh, some challenges that 5G is facing or is going to face. And then probably the beyond 5G use cases and the requirements. And then what are the next key technologies in the networking area that probably we have to look into so we can enable this um, beyond 5G or let's put it even 6G system. Um, I think you have already seen this diagram many times. Um, the good news is that actually phase two of um, uh, release 16 is almost over. And probably by the next year, we will see the first deployment of phase one um, uh, 5G. Um, the phase two is going to happen in 2021. And probably there will be lots of interesting things happening in phase three, which is, um, I think, just started. And I think Takehiro Nakamura-san, he has already spoken about uh, study items in really 17. Uh, but let's look at the current state of 5G. There are lots of interesting actually challenges and I will start with the business models. I think uh, 5G is really being um, introduced as the technology that will support loss of verticals, but will verticals pay for the connectivity? That's a really fundamental question. I think if we talk about automotive, will BMW or Mercedes will pay for the connectivity that other people will be using? That's a question. Uh, industrial, smart factories, do they need even an operator so they can actually operate their networks? That's also another question. So really there, there are some, some challenging business models there. Um, from the vendor perspective, 
I think there is still this um, trend towards this old business uh, style where they want to sell boxes rather than software that can run on the cloud. And because of this, really, the architecture is still tied to the 4G model. And I think even in the context of 5G, we will talk about that soon. Um, when the architecture of 5G was designed, still there was this reference point based model where you have one box talking to another box via uh, well dedicated interface. Um, regulations are actually not in favor of really promoting the technology and I think my colleague Raimo has spoken about net neutrality issues actually here in Europe. But there are lots of expenses coming with the licenses. There are also lots of legal issues with the launch of verticals that are actually supposed to be the prominent or the potential verticals of uh, 5G, like you know, automotive self-driving vehicles, UAVs. I don't know when we can have these actually uh, vertical terminals really running in the, on the road. Um, the other thing is, at least from discussion with some mobile operators, I sense it that many mobile operators are really not happy with 5G itself, because if you ask them, um, are they interested in launching 5G? Some of them, they were honest and they said, we will launch it only if our competitors will launch it. Because really, it's, it's very trivial. Why do I have to invest lots of money into something that will bring a little bit of revenue back to me? And that's actually the, that's the dilemma that they're dealing with, this low average revenue per user. Um, the other thing is really the 5G vision has been really ambitious and for this I really give a lot of credits for people that made the requirements of 5G and the use cases because they made the system or the envision of the system which is really powerful and really nice, you know, one millisecond latency. Today in the keynote of uh, Huawei we have actually heard 0.1 millisecond latency and in my opinion that's really challenging to achieve. So the situation is unclear and let's see what will happen. So, as I said, actually, really, I give lots of credits for people that have made the requirements of 5G and the use cases. Of course, like we're looking for a system which can achieve one millisecond latency end to end, um, high coverage capacity, so on and so forth. Um, if we try to categorize, you know, these use cases of 5G, probably we can put them in this um, eight uh, pictures. Um, I think the first one, which is this massive Internet of Things broadcast like services, probably with 4G, we can achieve it. And we have technologies in release 14 for that. Um, in my humble opinion, 5G can really support this enhanced mobile broadband, so services which needs lots of bandwidth, you know, those services mainly for the uplink, probably 5G can help. And we would need even more services uh, to be supported, you know, by 5G and beyond. But when it comes to this extreme low latency communications, there is a big question mark about the feasibility of the system that we will be seeing by 2020, 2021, whether it will really give us that one millisecond latency or even 10 millisecond latency. Honestly, I don't know if that's really doable. So there is a lot of room for 6G or for beyond 5G to achieve that extreme low latency and also this extreme or high reliability system that we're looking for or we've been looking for in 5G, but probably we won't be able to achieve it. Um, there are lots of interesting use cases that actually are envisioned in the context of, you know, beyond 5G. Um, I think we have seen many of them, you know, in many presentations, keynote. Um, some of them they are actually just highlighted here, but I think the video that we have about 6 Genesis really sums up everything there. So we would see this uh, holographic teleportation, augmented projection surfaces, situation uh, awareness, Internet of Things, and then putting there actually UAV and also uh, autonomous driving as really the beyond 5G use case because I don't think it will happen within 5G. That's actually my statement. And there are lots of other services that would need the latency which would not be provisioned in my opinion within 5G and that's why I put them there actually as deterministic services that will be provided in the beyond 5G system. Now um, let's look at the evolution that has happened in the last say four or five years. Um, first of all, in release 14, we started talking about multi-service, multi-tenancy, network sharing, different quality of service, dedicated core networks for certain services. That was really awesome. And I think probably some of them, they are even, you know, being provisioned. Um, in the context of 5G, we've been talking about softwareization, network slicing. So we have separated the control plane from the data plane. We have control planes per slice, a network function customization. We have actually reached this 
I think, big milestone, which is exposing the network to a third party. And in my opinion, that's really something which uh, was demanded by many um, uh, service providers, and it's somehow well thought of in the context of 5G. But what's still missing, in my opinion, and this is really what's defining the next generation, is the cloud nativeness of the mobile network. Because nowadays, networks are still, or the network functions are really still designed to be running in boxes. Or if even they are running actually on software, they have to stay there. If you're thinking about migrating a network function, which is component of certain network slice from an edge or from an EAS to another EAS, it's a very challenging problem. And people that are working on live migration probably can um, second me on this. Um, and you would need this kind of live migration if you're looking for one millisecond latency for services like the control of UAVs, like the autonomous cars and so on and so forth. So cloud nativeness is really something which is demanded and it can be achieved with this, you know, this new trend which is happening in the architecture, which is the service-based architecture, you know, based on microservice concept and so on. Uh, there is need to design control plain network functions, you know, new ones that can actually become what we call stateless and cloud native. Um, in my opinion, there is need to open up the network to third parties, and really this is something which is needed mainly when we think about artificial intelligence coming from different systems and trying to make something which is across these different systems and, you know, coming, coming up with an intelligence which is optimal for all the systems which are actually, you know, forming, you know, um, 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 uh, the ecosystem of mobile networks. Um, we will talk about data analytics, and this already starts happening, but really if we want to have the latency that we are actually looking for in 5G and beyond, there is need for much tighter integration between the transport network and the mobile network. And this is exactly what I would like to shed light on in the next few slides. Um, and this actually this, you know, defines this concept of deterministic networking or time-sensitive networking, as we will see. Okay, towards this vision of one minute, I don't have, I have many slides, all right. So I, so I have to go very quick. So, uh, all right, so let, let's say that actually we have this service-based architecture. It's really nice that actually it's already starts happening within 5G. They started in the beginning with this reference point-based model, but they found out that actually it's not the best way. So they made actually this new architecture of service-based architecture where you have one interface talking to different, you know, network functions. But in my opinion, this service-based architecture, it will not be successful unless we have these functionalities, which I'm, these features, which is allows coupling to the services, extensibility, this, you know, the, the services have to be really modular so you can move them. And also something which is very important, you have to be really open to the third party, you know, service provider. This is something which is really fundamental if you want to make any you know, meaning, you know, of the service, of the network architecture. In one word, the network architecture shall be truly cloud native. Uh, the other thing is, even if we talk about this 10 millisecond latency or 15 millisecond latency, you know, based on this, you know, the service that we target, we cannot guarantee that. And that's why probably we have to just say what is the maximum latency that a service can actually tolerate, and then try to use technologies from, or protocols from different standards like ITF or IEEE, and, you know, you know, achieve this deterministic network. And I would say for automotive services, the maximum I can actually tolerate is 10 milliseconds. So please try to play within that, you know, um, uh, that range. And uh, probably with this time sensitive networking, I think uh, maybe we need to do some kind of synchronization between the different routers and the switches which are actually involved in the communication of packets of a certain network slice. And basically here what I'm actually suggesting, that actually we need to really accurately to say to a certain packet of certain service, this is the queue. Once you go to this router, to this switch, this is the queue that you have to go through. And this is the exact time that this packet has to be gated out. And here, for the first time actually that I'm disclosing this term that I would like to coin, we're not talking about software-defined networking anymore. We have to talk about software-defined queuing and even software-defined gating out of the packets. And that's exactly how we can really get this latency that has been, you know, so much demanded, you know, in the context of 5G and beyond. And this is not going to happen unless we have this tighter integration with the transport network. And there are lots of standards which actually have to be really 
put together from different standards bodies. Um, the other thing which I want to highlight, and really I will second Henning here, there are lots of unuseful you know, protocols which we are using, and probably we have to think about smart routing protocols, protocols that can decide the service function chaining that you have to use for certain service, the queue that you have to go via, the links, and even which computation source and node that you have to go via so you can process your packets. And this is actually talking, here we're talking about segment routing, and Mati stands up, and I'm really scared, so I have to stop. Uh, but the last one is the data analytics, and I think there is already something happening within the 3GPP, this network data analytic function. Um, in my opinion, if we use it very well, we can achieve this concept of zero-touch provisioning. That means the network will be managed by itself, and we can actually impact lots of interesting services, starting from the de de dynamic network management, smart homes, object recognition, autonomous cars, and so on. And AI has a big play there, and I'm stopping. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Maria Martin Mikko Blue, talking about businesses of 6G. Thank you, Matti. So, this presentation is about the business aspects of mobile communication networks. and. Since this session is presenting the flagship 6G research themes, in addition to all these technical research themes that we do, there's also a very strong business and regulation re related research stream. So it's pretty well known now that the policymakers in Europe and globally, they have realized that these cellular networks, they are the backbone infrastructure for digitalization across different verticals. And the role of 5G, as you've heard, it really is addressing the industries. These kind of traditional sectors are going through this transformation to digitalization, and that is the role that 5G is trying to take. And this is, the, this is based on dense deployments of small cell networks in local areas, but surprisingly it's still happening by the big mobile network operators. A year ago we were predicting the trends of change. We were being very bold in saying that what would happen in 5G is that there would be a trend of change from traditional way to some new way from traditional long-term exclusive spectrum licenses towards local shorter-term spectrum licenses, from, out, well, from outdoor macrocells to small, indoor small cells. That is really happening. And then from a small number of dominating MNOs in each country to the emergence of a larger number of local operators. But that has not happened yet. And that is exactly the topic that we at the University of Oulu have been promoting very heavily in the last two, three years. Vertical sector specific local networks. And they are gaining interest in 5G, not only by the MNOs now. We saw that in those Nokia presentations, there is this growing trend towards private networks for industry needs. And those could be deployed by very different stakeholders in addition to the existing MNOs. And we call them 5G microoperators in many of our publications. And these locally deployed operator, op operated networks, the idea there is that they provide very high quality, guaranteed quality to various customer sets. There could be their own local customers, like in an, inside an industry, in, in an industry plant, that restricted customer set. Or then in difficult places where the MNOs are not willing to cover the place, there could be one local stakeholder to deploy the network and then serve all the MNO customers there. The MNOs would pay for that service and all would benefit. That would result in cost savings for the MNOs and so on. And the most complicated is, the bow, is, is, is a mix of these two. You would have a local network de deployed by a stakeholder serving MNO customers and then different sets of restricted customer sets. 
And then the role of regulation. So this is what we've been promoting. And then what is happening is that the regulation is in the key position to, to promote or hinder any development. And mobile operator business, it's pretty highly regulated in national level especially. Then in Europe, there's a lot of European level regulation on that. And the there are very big differences between the different countries' regulations. And then in principle, what regulation does, it brings together conflicting stakeholder views and tries to make the best for the mankind or the country in question in Europe Regulations tries to promote innovation and competition, be transparent and fair and so on. There are all these high-level goals. But what happens in practice, what has happened in practice in the mobile business, is the operator dominance. It's still in 5G development, the standards. It's what the operators have wanted. Spectrum regulation is in a key position then to allow the emergence of a large, larger number of locally deployed networks. And 5G, there will be a wide range of spectrum bands, different carrier frequencies, a lot of new spectrum is becoming available for 5G. And then the first, there are first 5G spectrum decisions made by different countries. For example, Finland auctioned the 3.5 GHz band last year to the three big mobile network operators. No surprises there, just the same way as, as before. Some others have done the same way. But then there are countries who are taking a more, more a different approach, like Germany has announced that they will make local, vertical-specific networks possible. They will give 100 megahertz of spectrum for these deployments, local, for local deployments, for the verticals. It's quite drastic change. What is possible in one country what was not made possible in one country is made possible elsewhere. And that changes the mobile business ecosystem in, in that country. So we did also a lot of research on spectrum aspects and realized that it is totally possible. There are all the tools and methods to do these local spectrum assignments and the interference coordination among the networks. So the business, going to the business ecosystems. MNO, we've heard it that MNOs used to make money with voice and text messages, but that has changed. Now it's about mobile data, and the over-the-top service providers have taken, taken a lot of the market, market. And then 5G, it will come to those verticals to some extent, and there will, there will be local, new ecosystems around those verticals. That will already happen through through 5G and there will be changes in the stakeholder roles. Not as, as rapidly or boldly as we initially predicted, but some of that will happen. But then 6G towards 2030, what could happen there? We believe that then there should be a, lo a larger number of locally deployed networks and then the users, whether they are humans or machines or whatever, it would be easy for them to join those networks on demand and seamlessly. And this would not only result in a new ecosystem around 6G, but also additionally all those different ecosystems around the different vertical applications. So to conclude, 5G had already a lot of promises. It was supposed to revolutionize the mobile business ecosystem, bring mobile connectivity to serve all the industries. But this is, to a large extent, based on the MNO deployments. Something is happening. So there are some places where these local deployments are, are happening. And there will be new vertical-specific ecosystems. So the starting point in 6G, should then be that we should get rid of the old legacy. We should do conmari as, as, as was suggested before. Get rid of what is not needed anymore and start from a fresh point of view to make new things possible. To make it possible for those who wish to deploy a high quality cellular network, that they would be able to do that. And that is highly dependent on the spectrum access rights. They would need those local spectrum access rights to do that. Unlicensed bands are there, there will be more, and there will be networks in the unlicensed bands. But then the guaranteed quality of services are, are, a, are a challenge. So
So if this all happened, there would be a totally new 6G business ecosystem and all those vertical specific business ecosystems. And then there are several, several papers from our previous research. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Jaap van der Beek, and I'm, um, I'm actually uh, working... Do you want maybe the full screen? Yes, full screen. Okay, Let's see. okay good. Um, so this is, this is some work that, uh, that uh, uh, Luleå University of Technology in the north of Sweden is, uh, is uh, jointly um, engaged in together with, uh, with Olu. And uh, uh, it's about rural, rural communications, rural, rural connectivity. When I drove here in, the, in my taxi from the airport uh, yesterday, uh, I had a nice uh, uh, connection coming at the airport. And uh, again, here uh, I have a perfect, perfect connectivity. In between, halfway, uh, on my phone, the connectivity had dropped to one out of five pins, you know. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm not, I, was not, I wasn't surprised about, about that, because the situation is the same, basically, in the north of Sweden, where, where my university is. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, very unusual to find that in the, in the region, in the Stockholm region, for instance, where I live, to, to have this kind of uh, strong variations. Uh, so, <coughs> rural communications, uh, and, and, you know, uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me that if, if, uh, if I would have turned, take a turn right into the forest, that I would have been uh, taking a fallback to the th 3G or, or even 2G. Uh, rural communications uh, is, is really about, uh, uh, you have, uh, the rurality is limited. R with respect to the infrastructure, uh, we, have, uh, we have little roads, few roads, few infrastructures. Uh, we have uh, limited ele electricity access often. Uh, the grid is, of, is not, uh, is not uh, nearby. Uh, the, the backhaul is bad. We have, on the other hand, few people, so we have probably lots of, uh, lots of capacity. And there is, an, in, in fact, in, in rural, there is an abundance of spectrum, not in the sense that, there is, uh, that, that, that the bandwidths are so li large, but in the sense that spectrum is not used. And a lot of spectrum is actually empty and not used by, uh, by operators. Um, so, uh, this is going to out of sync. Um, so uh, the, let's look back at 5G. Uh, uh, back back in, uh, in uh, for four years ago, um, um, 5G was uh, is, is promising everywhere, connectivity everywhere, 50 megabits per second everywhere. And the the question is justified if that is uh, if, if 5G delivers. And uh, the answer would is the answer is probably the answer is probably no. Uh, let's see if I can. Um, so, so basically, uh, it depends on what you mean by everywhere. And if you look, if you ask the operators, every ma me everywhere means is uh, up to the cell edge, you know, at the cell edge boundaries. Uh, but it's still at the discretion of the operators to, to, to choose whether or not to, uh, to, to deploy uh, base stations uh, in certain positions. And, and uh, that is actually the problem. The potential revenue per area is like orders of magnitude lower. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, strange that operators are not, are not building infrastructure in, 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 in mountainous regions like, or, or, or rural regions like here. Um, <clears throat> and yet, the values here are in, 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 rural, in rurality are large. Uh, there is large economic values in terms of forestry, mining, there's power, um, tourism is, is, is increasing, et cetera, et cetera. And there's uh, increasingly more societal values as well uh, that needs to be you know, taken into account. And there's the public services to the people living there, the, the attraction to live here, uh, counteract you know, the, the urbanization, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, safety security is, in, is, is, is getting higher on the agenda. You know, you know, people want to call 911 everywhere. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, you know, ambitious targets for the connectivity, both on the European level and in, in, in Sweden. Uh, and the the idea of uh, of um, or one of the one of the uh, the characteristics of digital of, of, of connectivity in, in rurality is like that you have clusters. People tend to live in clusters. So so we have to think of this uh, of these. Uh, 
uh, uh, these clusters where people live as an oasis, a digital oasis where typically you have a, a, a very good connectivity locally, uh, very high data rates and high networks, but you have a very poor backhaul. You have a very you're far away from the urban uh, internet that uh, that. Um, um, that um, we are used to in the, in, the, in the cities. And the question is, can or will, <coughs> if, if 5G doesn't really have, for, has re really somehow has forgotten about this, the, to, to addressing this, can, can 60 or will 6G uh, do that? Um, so there is this kind of a rural hotspot uh, where, where, uh, where um, uh, not in the, in the sense of a Wi-Fi hotspot, but in the sense of such a cluster, an oasis. And there's a number of, uh, of, of, of um, um, uh, technologies or, or uh, solutions or aspects that, uh, that may help to solve these kinds of, uh, of problems in the, in the future. We have the integration with satellite networks, new operators, we, have, we've heard, uh, we, have, we just have uh, heard about that. We have energy autonomous micro stations. Just imagine that the, in the future we can just drop a base station uh, anywhere in the forest without having to rely on an electricity grid, without having to rely on maintenance roads, etc. That would re drastically reduce the, uh, the, um, uh, the capex and the, the investments. Um, so basically, the, uh, we, we need to somehow find uh, uh, models that, uh, that, on one hand, we, we have the competition working nicely in urban areas. You know, our mar the market-based solutions and market-based, uh, competition-based uh, um, developments have served us, you know, very well over 30, 40 years. Uh, but in, in the rural, we have to somehow rely on other models. There's, uh, otherwise, we have... We get like local small mon monopolies in the in the in the in the rural. Okay, Maria has been take, talking about this. I want to lift one before before we stop here. I want to lift one uh, uh, thing that is uh, close to my heart. It's the reuse of the TV inf uh, infrastructure. We've heard it a couple of in a, in a couple of talks earlier today. Um, we have a, a very good infrastructure in, in most of the rural regions as well of our countries here. And that's the, these high towers, these high, high masts. And th uh, these operators, TV operators, may soon be out of business anyway. So they are, they are you know, interested in new business models, etc., etc. And they, are, they serve our goals for the rules very well. Um, <coughs> so similar to... Uh, to, uh, to um, uh, uh, historically, we started with the first generation of NMT, which people in the rural still know have, has very good coverage. And then, uh, in the next uh, uh, um, the next uh, generations, this coverage has been worse. Yes, there have been built more uh, more infrastructure has been built, but uh, the, the 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 range of the base station has been less. So the idea is to use these high uh, TV towers now again to have some kind of an umbrella network with full coverage, um, uh, high power, high tower. We've heard uh, we have that, heard that before, and these rural hotspots that we have, these uh, oases, they can use these these uh, these high towers as a as a backhaul, and uh, at the same time these these uh, these uh, umbrella uh, uh, networks uh, provide connectivity, you know, even in places where there is no connectivity at all today. Okay, so I can browse here. So already now we're we're in the in the uh, in the in the uh, we're we're close to starting you know an, a, a test in the, in the north of Sweden uh, with huge antennas. This is classical antenna antenna technology. There's a, the, these antennas. They have uh, it's beam forming in the in the elevation in the uh, elevation beam forming, and they uh, provide 30 de decibels more of um, of uh, um, um, uh, the path loss and, 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 and again in, in terms of uh, uh, the beam forming, and they, that's up to 30, 40 kilometers uh, uh, more uh, coverage from a base station. Um, so there, beside these these uh, these uh, high towers, what can the base station do more? We have higher towers, higher powers. We ha power. We have carrier irrigation, MIMO. We have high, very high sectorization. 
And we may also use uh, different protocols where we reduce the data rate uh, uh, slightly. In a later stage for, for 6G, we have these massive MIMO uh, ideas that today are very much looked into for capacity regions in, 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 in high density and urban environments. But there may be also hold the promise for, uh, for, these, uh, for, the, for the rural regions. And at the user equipment, we can also think of some, some uh, Im improvements. And ranges up to 80 kilometers uh, from with, these, uh, with these improvements are possible. And that is actually sufficient to have these large base stations, these TV network uh, infrastructure actually cover most of the, uh, most of the, the, the areas. So my last slide, so if I ha would have this uh, presentation, you know, uh, for a year ago, I would be rather pessimistic and it would rather be, be more alarming. But I'm, uh, during the last year, I've been, been more hopeful about, you know, the, the, the trends, because there are some um, drivers that actually that are promising and appear to actually um, drive these developments in the proper direction. So we have these safety and security that I mentioned earlier. That is, uh, it's, it's a very... Uh, important driver nowadays, and uh, and um, uh, we also have these uh, the blue light services, and, and and people need to be connected, and 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 um, uh, so so the public sector is really getting involved because of this, and it, it may be combined with these uh, with with the, with the um, the commercial networks, autonomous transports, and other uh, you know mobile IoT uh, is also an important driver because. Simply, uh, you cannot drive, send autonomous vehicles or, or, or drones uh, out there if you don't, if you don't uh, be able to follow them and connect to them. Uh, and finally, again, the public sector, inclusive societies, uh, the, 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 the attraction in the, in the countryside. Uh, there is this digital divide. Even in countries like, like Sweden, there is, uh, there is an, a, a clear and growing divide between the countryside and the, uh, and the cities, which... Last, during the last one or two years, you know, people have been much more aware of. And uh, so, basically, that concludes my talk. Thanks. Can I now ask uh, all presenters to step up here and and. Uh, Let's start to discuss. You can throw eggs and tomatoes if you wish. Also, uploading is definitely fine. Whatever you want. But who would like to start shooting? Questions, comments? Is everybody tired? Okay. Evening. It's not on. <laughs> okay, shout out. <laughs> On the last presentation, uh, question is how do you, s I mean, what kind of aggregate framework do you see in those type of uh, high power, high power systems uh, being possible, providing a lower coverage? Yeah, so the, 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 um, the, um, the test that we envisage now, uh, we'll use the uh, three and a half gigahertz band. And we will use up. Well, we have carrier aggregation there. It's it's uh, initially it's uh, LTE, and uh, we have some carrier aggregation there. And uh, and uh, so I don't know exactly, but it's up to perhaps 100 megahertz. Fine. 20, 20 megahertz aggregate uh, and, and and aggregated. Yeah, probably. Maybe they can use this mic. In the meanwhile, um, it's really not a question but a comment uh, to the last talk uh, that we heard. Uh, you may have heard about uh, work going on in IEEE uh, called Frugal 5G. 
and uh, their goal is also to provide uh, coverage in the rural areas uh, using uh, uh, carpet coverage using the cellular network uh, for the village and using SDN and NFV and fog networking to provide intelligence at the edge, uh, using something called uh, uh, um, a bundle network, a backhaul, using TV white space or some of that technology. So there is work going on in Frugal 5G to make it affordable, to make it uh, uh, cheap. So the network solution is cheap for the uh, rural communities. I just wanted to make that comment if you were not aware of it. And that work is called IEEE P2061 uh, committee. Yeah. Um, about this techno-economics <coughs> side of things, sort of if you. Uh, um, uh, starting point is uh, sort of confrontation of the micro operators and the MNOs. Maybe that's not the best approach because then the <coughs> question is why would the technology stay uh, coherent and, and sort of uniform for uh, these both uh, camps? Maybe then uh, the micro operators, operators want to develop their completely their own technology. Why would they sort of uh, follow the ideas of uh, what the uh, MNOs are using? Uh, so. Uh, Alternatively, we could look at uh, uh, different uh, boundaries between the two, sort of like uh, uh, these micro-operators or whatever you want to call them, they could be seen as community subscribers to the MNO, and then <coughs> you could discuss the question of what exactly are the functions that they handle locally and what uh, they delegate to the MNO, and, and see uh, whether there's a compromise uh, solution that, uh, that allows everybody to be happy, sort of like uh, the lamps are alive and the wolves are <laughs> not hungry. <laughs> Thank you, Raimo. So up to now, it has been possible to deploy <coughs> local networks using the unlicensed bands. There are a lot of private Wi-Fi based corporate networks. That's the dominant mechanism until now. But then there has been the trend that to that what if you could actually deploy your cellular 3GPP technology network locally by a non-MNO? And that has been the game changer. So this different, it's a move from one camp to another to make it possible also on the other side. And then there are a lot of different roles that these local operators, what they do themselves, what they buy from others, what, what is their role. There are so many variations and so many levels that, that there could be a lot of different alternatives on how that could be deployed in the different vertical cases. Uh, I have a question for the networking aspects you touched based upon. I think. Uh, you talked about deterministic networking, uh, which is mostly IETF driven and IEEE sometimes, uh, but it is only for the enterprise scale, right? It's not large scale, but a lot of the requirements for 5G are QoS related and even more for stringent cost requirements of future. And segment routing also doesn't care, talk about a uh, lot of cost requirements. So what are the research that's happening uh, uh, in, that, in that area actually? Uh, would you repeat your question? Sorry. So uh, I think some of the technologies you enlisted, yeah. they don't provide, there is no data point for providing costs and you know, there is no actual deployment data points at this point, right? So uh, is there any research happening in that area or uh, what you guys are thinking about that? Um, well, it's something that we would like to do research about definitely. Uh, we see potential there actually, um, you're right, that's actually some of the solutions, they're actually designed for enterprise solutions, yeah. But um, if you think about the services that would need, you know, that very short latency, you're not talking about services that have to be deployed really at a global scale. It's like really maybe services that should be deployed and managed, you know, in certain neighborhood. So it's like kind of an enterprise, but a neighborhood network. Um, so how you can manage, you know, that, um, you know, for example, leverage time sensitive networking so you can really do accurate queuing and so on. So it's, as I said, for the services that will be local to that locality. Yeah. Um, uh, there are lots of standards happening, but uh, for different use cases, there are some researchers that start looking into this problem. But unfortunately, 
the community is not big enough. And that's why, per personally, I see lots of potential there. So, uh, and that's why even I said I'm the first one to coin the term software-defined queue, and I don't know if it has been well received, but maybe there is potential to go to the queue level, you know, to do things right. How do you see this uh, interplay of uh, 6G with other wireless technologies and, uh, in a way, the complementation or competition of 6G, like uh, uh, Wi-Fi based uh, technologies, and uh, especially this uh, is uh, most relevant maybe then in, uh, in these uh, vertical sectors, and they all have their own type of approaches uh, from the history. Uh, based on, on technology and uh, technologies used and business models. And you are asking whom? I may start. Maybe you can you comment. Uh, our view is that in the future uh, we need much more uh, interoperability and compatibility. Let me give you an example uh, from logistics. If you send a parcel to the other side of the world, uh, and, and we track the parcel, whatever we ship, with different IO, through different IoT networks, IoT systems. So we're talking about multi-tenant systems. Uh, we have lots of challenges. We have lots of challenges in identifying the packets. If we, if we have NB IoT type of solution, we need, you must have a SIM card as one example. But what we would like to, like to see in the future is that uh, we shouldn't care about what access network you connect to. You just, you just simply do the job. It's a lot of transparency, openness. Of course, it's technically a huge challenge, but, but uh, our thinking is that IoT explosion is blocked by many different things currently, and we need much more openness. But these guys and girls may continue. You have other comments on that? It will be interesting to see, we, it's hard to say what will be the role of 6G and Wi-Fi and so on, but it will be interesting <coughs> to see what will happen in 5G in terms of these verticals. Will 5G really meet those expectations or will they still be based on, on, on Wi-Fi networks? If, if I take a short perspective on this really wideband stuff then, you, you need to have the kind of the traffic in all levels so the radio end is only the final one if you are dreaming about to put their terabit per second and so forth it's not straightforward in any kind of technology that is kind of combined from different things so at least there is an opportunity for the industry to kind of make a lean end-to-end -end service as we have been discussing today so radio alone is not in enough and that makes the system complexity such a way that the companies that are solving that are in the strong position um, Miko, if, if you allow, I, I would like to add actually one thing. Um, you know, IEEE family technology accesses, they were somehow like treated like, you know, separate from the 3GPP family. And even they're called the non-3GPP accesses, right? But from release 10 or even earlier, Wi-Fi was actually qualified as a trusted non-3GPP access. And if you go to the standards 234402, you will see that there are all the standards necessary to make you know, this interoperability between you know, Wi-Fi network and the 3GPP system. Basically, with my phone, I connect to the mobile network, I go to a place where there is lots of Wi-Fi um, accesses, automatically I should change you know, to the Wi-Fi network. But it's not happening. Maybe this is, not be this is because mobile operators are not interested or... But the standards are there, and this is since release 10. Um, okay, Mati, you have Let's take to another say? question. <laughs> yeah, here we go. So I got, I got a question actually to uh, Professor Denis. So you presented actually quite an ambitious framework for uh, distributed AI, federated AI, collaborative AI, right? And machine learning, obviously. So do you see actually any challenges in terms of interoperability in the context of collaborative AI and federated AI? And if so, do you anticipate any need for standardization? 
So very good question, of course. So. Uh, so uh, let me start with the first one. So of course, so when it comes to so, so the main premise of this framework, in fact, which is great. Uh, so of course, so pri privacy and, uh, and trust are two main requirements. Perhaps so we didn't have them in 5G, but 6G will have them. The idea is, if even if two actors, as I mentioned before, uh, have co are competitors, right, and uh, they have limited data sets, right. So the idea is they could still collaborate without disclosing their private uh, data, right, so as to build a, a better model and draw uh, inference from there. So this applies for uh, for all verticals, in fact, right? For for automotive sector, can even go for hospitals, in healthcare, could go for, yeah. So this is the power of this framework, of course, but uh, it has a lot of technical challenges, as, as I have uh, mentioned, right? Uh, such as the uh, need to adapt not only to the global model, but also to the local, local uh, aspects of it, right? Uh, in terms of standardization, so I mean, uh, I'm not so much focused on that part. Of course, I know that's important for GPP and Etsy and others, but there is a lot of work, I mean, uh, now in this uh, ENI, right, in Etsy. The idea, as far as I understood, is the idea is how, which telemetry data are we going to expose to this type of applications, right? So. How good is the data? This is very important. Uh, how trustworthy is the data in order to use it to do uh, all sorts of things? So I think this is the, their main focus. I don't think they, they will look into uh, you know, training and inference. This is the algorithmic part, which as, as far as I know, it's per vendor or per, I don't know. Yeah. But I think it's what comes in as an input, right? So how do you get it? How do you uh, process it and so on, yeah. I think it's time to start to wrap up. It's seven o'clock already. When do we go home? Is that the question? <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow. This is easy. <laughs> the next one, we have not yet decided the date, but uh, about one year from now. Uh, we will announce it at our web pages and, and, and maybe through some emails. Uh, so we have been hearing two days about very interesting views on, on the latest developments on, on mobile communications from various different players in the field. And uh, I've been so far actually pretty pleased to also see that industry dares to mention this swear word 6G, uh, which wasn't the case a few months ago. And, uh, our thinking seems to be quite well aligned. So we keep on mind that we are talking about solutions and technology services for 2030s. Tomorrow, some of us will continue uh, uh, thinking it a little bit harder and more detailed what it will be. Also, I was quite surprised even to see that there was one presentation today showing 8G. I'm going to do better. <laughs> Thank you and have a safe trip back home. See you next year. <laughs>